So welcome everyone. I see we've got a lot of people online. Um, I'm Caroline Ross. I'm going to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jiha Sun, who is a student in my group and also in Professor Jeremiah Johnson's group in the Department of Chemistry. So um, Jiha came here in uh, uh, September of 2019, so just before the pandemic struck. He has a um, bachelor's from Peking University in China in chemistry and molecular engineering. And he's done a super fantastic job here um, working on self-assembly of very complex block copolymers, which includes both the synthesis and the um, characterization of these fascinating materials. So um, let me hand over to Ji Hao to give his uh, presentation. And uh, by a nice coincidence, the paper that this work is described in just came out yesterday, and you can see the um, uh, reference at the bottom of the slide. So Ji Hao, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for the very nice introduction. And thank you for all the audience to come today to attend my talk. So today I will show you the discovery of uh, a, a new mesh-like network morphology by block polymer self-assembly under a uh, bottom-up molecular confinement. As material scientists, we sometimes um, uh, care less about uh, the organization and the structures smaller than uh, one nanometer, which is the length scale of uh, uh, typical crystal lattices and molecules because we view them as building blocks to our ultimate uh, structures and materials. And when it comes to uh, a length scale that goes beyond one micron, then um, top-down uh, 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 processing techniques have been ubiquitous. So the real challenge is really something in the middle here, that is the creation of nanostructures or nanomaterials in the mesoscale. And that is the, um, the grand promise of self-assembly. And we can also choose different um, interactions as the driving force for self-assembly. But in our lab, we mainly focus on one of the simplest form, that is immiscibility. Just like oil does not mix with water, most polymers just do, do not mix with one another. But that is uh, macroscopic phase separation, as uh, shown in the previous slide. If we want to make nanostructures, then we do a very simple trick, that is to covalently bind these two polymer blocks together. And this covalent junction then serves as a, a, a constraint. Then through the interplay uh, between enthalpy and entropy, it will uh, readily self-assemble to microphase separate into um, these well-known well morphologies, uh, such as spheres, cylinders, uh, gyroid, and lamella. And if we happen to know the interactions between these two polymer blocks, that is the flooring Huggins parameter, chi, the length of the, uh, the, the polymer chain, that is the degree of polymerization, as well as the, um, the ratio of uh, these two blocks, that is the volume fractions, then we can easily predict a phase diagram out of it using the, uh, the parameters we just defined. So the true beauty of uh, this block of polymer self-assembly is that the whole process is spontaneous, which means we don't need to do much about it. Uh, then it will form these nanostructures. Uh, but the uh, spontaneous nature of self-assembly is both bless and bane, because thermodynamics will tend to, uh, to, to minimize the interfacial uh, curvature and maximize symmetry. And this law will limit uh, the uh, self-sampled morphologies to a very limited selection as shown here. When it comes to a very specific case, that is this uh, network regime here, uh, which means one of the polymer blocks form interconnected networks throughout the whole space. Because we don't exert any uh, constraint in any of the three directions 
uh, in space. Uh, thermodynamics will tend to give these uh, cubic symmetry morphologies, such as gyroid and diamond. The only known exception as uh, uh, in, an equilibrium phase is this orthorhombic O70 uh, phase. But if we draw the phase region of this O70 in, a, in an updated phase diagram, then we can find that this only happens in the weak segregation limit. And, in, it, and that it only occupies a very small fraction in a phase diagram. So that makes it very hard to control. That said, um, according to the symmetry uh, constraint, uh, we can really obtain very few uh, uh, range of morphologies. For example, um, single layer or multi-layer nano mesh structures are of particular interest because it has many uh, in, uh, applications. This is a network morphology, but it's not an isotropic network uh, like the cubic symmetric uh, morphologies like gyroid in the previous slide. So it's really challenging to fabricate these kind of nanostructures through block polymer self-assembly. In fact, so far, this, uh, the state of the art is to uh, successively overlay line patterns one, uh, one layer by one layer. And, and you can imagine that if you want to have many layers of uh, mesh, then it will be a very tedious work. So how to solve this problem? As outlined in the previous slide, the key really lies in symmetry breaking. We gained inspiration from our previous work on topographical confinement. That is, we uh, modify the surface of the substrate with these regularly arranged post arrays. And immediately we observed uh, new symmetries. For example, for this uh, cylinder forming sample, it, it will then form uh, spontaneously this kind of mesh structure. And for this perforated lamella forming sample, it will then uh, evolve into this archimedium tiling structure with much lower symmetry. And this, these are very good examples of how top down helps bottom up. Uh, but we note that the, uh, the other way around, that is uh, how the, uh, this confinement effect was uh, um, achieved in um, uh, bottom-up uh, design is very minimally studied. And we wonder if the same effect can be achieved by uh, molecular design, uh, synthesis and design. So in, in, in this work, we uh, um, uh, used this um, recently developed tri-block tri drainless bottle brush called polymer as a platform to investigate uh, intrinsic molecular confinement effect which is an, a bottom-up design. And what does this, mean, uh, this name mean? Uh, so bottle brush, as its name indicates, uh, the polymer is composed of a backbone that is uh, densely grafted with side chains. And why do we call it drainers? That is because the backbone can be viewed as separated by two um, separate subdomains. And one of the subdomains is further separated by two chemically distinct blocks. And uh, the, the, uh, the elegance of this design is that uh, the self-assembly, the microphase separation can uh, happen relatively independently in two orthogonal direction. What do I, what, what do, do I mean by um, independently? For example, if we make uh, one of the uh, the subdomain to be lamella forming, that is this lamella superstructure shown in this figure, then we can just keep this fixed and change all the parameters in this subdomain to uh, change to get different uh, substructures. And on top of that, this substructure is confined by the lamella superstructure. And by doing so, we, we say this is uh, a, a bottom-up molecular confinement 
which is uh, qualitatively different from this top-down uh, topo topographical confinement. And first of all, we need to synthesize our polymer material. And the bottle brush polymer was synthesized through ring opening metathesis polymerization or rump of this macromolymer. The macromolymer is composed of a polymerizable part grafted with this polymer chain. And rump is a living polymerization. So what do I mean by living? So once the chain is initiated, uh, it remains reactive uh, unless you uh, intentionally terminate it. So then during the process, the uh, monomer can just add to the existing, the propagating chain one by one. And this forms this homocene domain. And then, as I mentioned, the chain never uh, terminates unless you do so. So it still remains reactive. And then you can add into the system uh, a, a second macromonomer. Uh, with these two different uh, polymer blocks attached to this very same uh, polymerizable part. And then the chain further propagates uh, into uh, this tri-block genus bottle brush copolymer shown in the previous slide. And then the polymer sample was characterized by size exclusion uh, chromatography. The y-axis is the intensity and the x-axis is the retention time. And the larger the retention time, the smaller the molecular weight. So you can see that the two macromonomers are with the largest uh, retention time, meaning that they have smaller uh, molecular weights. And we start from this uh, orange curve here, which uh, then propagate into this homo C domain here, shown as this um, green curve. And then we add into the reaction system a second macromonomer, this branched macromonomer here, uh, shown as the blue curve here. And once we do so, the chain further propagates into this red curve. And the uh, chromatogram indicates that the uh, reinitiation of the first block is almost uh, quantitative. And that's the consumption of the macromonomer is also relatively complete. So now that we have synthesized our material, we then investigated the molecular uh, confinement self-assembly. As outlined in the previous slide, uh, the superstructure is uh, uh, formed through these, uh, uh, the self-assembly, the microphage separation along the backbone direction. And that superstructure, the matter superstructure, then uh, intrinsically confine the formation of the substructure. And fortunately enough, we observe this new mesh-like network morphology as our substructure. And as a whole, uh, this uh, substructure and the superstructure forms the uh, mesh in lamella uh, hierarchical structure. As I mentioned previously, the uh, substructure and the superstructure formation can be tuned uh, relatively independently. And indeed, in our uh, case, when we uh, uh, anneal the sample using some vapor, the formation of the superstructure and the substructure is, is also stepwise. And in our particle, the lamella superstructure forms first. And then we further fine tune the uh, solvent annealing condition to better align the mesh like substructure. This slide shows some nice pictures of uh, SEM uh, images of our sample. On the top left uh, is the top view of our mesh uh, substructure. And by uh, uh, tuning the annealing condition, we can achieve. Uh, a very ordered uh, mesh-like morphology over a very large area, and it remains uh, defectless over uh, a micron scale, as indicated by this fast Fourier transform. It also tells us uh, from the fast Fourier transform that the included angle of the mesh is about 54 degrees, and the uh, half pitch of this line uh, line pattern is a, is uh, something around eight nanometers. 
Yeah, so that's the substructure. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the superstructure and the substructure uh, is formed uh, and tuned independently. So we can simply change the film thickness to tune the number of uh, lamella superstructures while maintaining the substructure uh, being uh, the mesh-like throughout. So we, by simply changing the uh, film thickness, we can achieve single layer, double layer, tri-layer, tetra-layer, up to 50 layer of nano meshes. And you can imagine if we want to uh, uh, fabricate this 50 layer uh, nano, mesh, uh, nano mesh morphology uh, by layer by layer technique, then that will be a very daunting task. But in our case here, we just spontaneously form this uh, 50 layer nano mesh structure in one annealing step. All right, so uh, actually I have to tell you that the, uh, the, first uh, the first observation of this uh, mesh substructure was exactly two years ago. And uh, during these two years, we obtained the top view and a cross-sectional view of SEM uh, images, but it took us a really long time to understand what the 3D structure of this new morphology is because no one else has ever observed it before. Our first attempt was to use uh, small angle X-ray scattering, sex. Um, for those who are not familiar with sex, it's just like uh, uh, XRD of crystals, but uh, the difference is that it, it's probing a larger length scale under of, uh, on the order of 10 to 100 uh, nanometers. But the problem with sex with scattering technique in our case here is that, well, our, our material, our structure is not like a crystal, it's not 3D periodic. The substructure is more like a 2D lattice and it's cut off by the lamella superstructure. So you have these uh, slices of uh, 2D uh, crystals. So uh, there is no longer translational symmetry along this third direction. And uh, as a simulation of this, this kind of situation, the fast Fourier transform, uh, 3D fast Fourier transform of this kind of structure show very severe peak broadening and, um, and, and loss of information. So scattering techniques can really tell us very minimal amounts of knowledge in our system. Um, and I think the best lesson I learned in this project is, well, uh, the, the uh, nowadays the modern um, characterization techniques of nanomaterials is really amazing. So we can directly obtain the, to reconstruct the 3D structure of our material by using tomography. So what, what do we do? We first uh, use focused IM beam to cut a very thin slice of our material and then image use using TM, uh, STM uh, at different tilting angles. Then we, uh, uh, through the development of algorithm, we can just reconstruct the whole 3D structure of the uh, tomogram. And only by then we can draw the firm conclusion that indeed our structure, the, our substructure is a new morphology with uh, this monoclinic symmetry. And it's, it belongs to the 15th space group. So we term it as M15 and no one has ever ob observed these kind of morphologies before in uh, soft matter. And now that we have uh, obtained the 3D structure of the, uh, of the substructure, then we can uh, exclude the, uh, the, the influence of the superstructure by taking out just one layer of substructure and then do fast Fourier transform. And then uh, it, uh, it fits quite well with our uh, mathematical model, confirming that indeed our structure is monoclinic and belongs to the 15th space group. Next, I will show some um, raw data of our to tomography experiment. So as I said, we first cut a thin slice and then tilt the sample under uh, the microscope. And as the, uh, the number indicates uh, here, uh, we are just tilting it at different angles and then we can observe different projections. 
then this uh, tilt series was stacked in the reciprocal space. And then we do uh, inverse for a transform to get the uh, real space uh, 3D structure. And we can first view it as uh, a depth stack. That, that This is just like um, a CT scan in the medical industry. So you're just looking at different slices at different Z positions. Yeah, but this might tell you a very minimal amount of information. So we can change the viewing direction from top to down. So you can see that um, the mesh uh, structure is indeed, it first, uh, it composed of first uh, uh, parallel lines at uh, one direction. And then while we increase the depth of it, sorry. Yeah. It then gradually become uh, parallel lines at a different direction. So uh, then uh, these two uh, parallel lines at different directions forms the mesh structure. So that, that is one layer of substructure. And that then that is the uh, superstructure, uh, lamellar superstructure in the middle. And then it comes to another layer of mesh-like substructure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we can, in addition to the, uh, uh, the, the depth stack we just showed right now, we can also render it in 3D. Sorry. Yeah. So while rotating the whole sample, you can you can clearly see that uh, the top surface of the uh, mesh-like structure is uh, parallel lines at one direction, and the one is rotated into a different angle. You can view from the bottom that um, it's composed of parallel lines at a different direction. And we can also compare our uh, 3D reconstructed model with a mathematical model of M15. And you can see that the, uh, the, uh, these projections are qualitatively uh, match well with each other. So this further confirmed that our, uh, our mesh-like substructure is indeed uh, a, 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 an undiscovered F M15 um, monoclinic network. So because uh, human is uh, inherently uh, bad in imagining about uh, 3D structure, so I just show some uh, ball and stick and uh, uh, mathematical 3D models here. So you can see that uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the connectivity of the M15 network, it's very close, uh, it, it closely re resembles the a, a previous um, reported O70 morphology, the, the orthorhombic, orthorhombic FDDD structure, but it's more like a, a distorted uh, uh, O70. So it further decreases the symmetry of it to monoclinic. And also another way of visualizing this M15 network is, as I just mentioned in the previous tomogram uh, slide, it composed of one set of parallel lines at one direction. And at the bottom, it's parallel lines at a different direction. But it's noteworthy that these parallel lines are not uh, straight, but rather wavy in the outer plane direction. Uh, so that the, uh, if you view from the side, uh, these they, they form these uh, run holes, but with a staggered configuration, this hexagonally packed uh, configuration. Yeah. All right. So because today I think the audience might be more interested in uh, nanotechnology rather than nanoscience, although I would really much want to uh, show all of the data in the paper, but I think I will just go through this uh, very quickly. So the take home message here is that uh, if we uh, synthesize the die block without the con constraining um, third block, the unconstrained self-assembly 
will give cubic symmetric uh, dry rod morphology uh, in this uh, phase region. And in about the same phase region as the dry rod region in the unconfined die block case, we observe this mesh-like monoclinic M15 structure. So that means that the intrinsic self-assembly can really uh, replace a known high symmetry morphology with a disparate uh, low symmetry new, uh, new morphology. And the mechanism of the formation of this low symmetry uh, morphology is because uh, when you have a third confining um, block, then the uh, the end of the backbone must be pinned at this uh, superstructure interface, and that will uh, cause certain um, frustration of the packing modes of the backbones, uh, leading to destabilization of the uh, the previously more stable gyroidal morphology. Yeah. So as I said, uh, because we are out of time, so I will just briefly go over all of these contents. Uh, but if you are interested in the science behind this phenomenon, then uh, I really recommend you to check out our paper, uh, which was published online just yesterday. And this work uh, can only be done through the collaborative efforts of all co-authors, and I, I would really uh, like to thank them. And especially, I would like to thank Professor Caroline Ross and uh, Jeremiah Johnson for the tremendous help and, uh, uh, and, and, and support during this project. And I, uh, last but not least, I would also, also like to thank Cherise um, for uh, giving me such a great chance to show my work in the webinar series. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, let's give some applause, um, either online or um, you can wave. So um, we're going to have some questions now. You can either um, raise your hand, press the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you prefer, you can um, uh, type in a question either into the chat or into the Q&A box, which we have a few questions in there already. So um, let me start by asking one of those questions while others are thinking of their own questions. Um, so in the Q&A box, um, we have one question. Why, why don't you form spontaneous shapes instead of being confined to symmetrical forms? So I think this is a question about the nature of um, block copolymer self-assembly, why it comes out to form such um, regular symmetrical forms. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned in the very first slide, uh, uh, the formation of such morphologies is through the interplay of enthalpy and entropy. Uh, the, entro the entropic part tells you that the polymer chains does not want to uh, be stretched too much because that will uh, lose a lot of uh, conformations and that will be entropically uh, expensive. And on the other hand, you, want, you don't want to uh, have a very large area in the interface. And that is, I think that is the key question related to this question. Because the nature wants to, uh, um, to minimize the surface, uh, the interfacial uh, uh, area. So it won't uh, evolve into a very complex shape because for complex shapes, it, the, um, the interfacial area will be larger. So that's, uh, I think, one aspect of, uh, of this question. Another aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of this question is that because if you, have, uh, you form in these network morphologies, uh, then because uh, you don't exert any kind of confinement in any of the directions. So it must be an isotropic uh, structure because you don't um, have any kind of anisotropic um, um, interaction, so it, it won't uh, spontaneously evolve into anisotropic structures. So I think uh, uh, one is the surface area consideration and the other is the symmetry consideration. And I think by combining these two aspects together, then we can answer the question of why nature does not form complex structures by self-assembly. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Hopefully. Um... Uh, we have another question. Anyone live want to ask a question? Just 
press the raise hand button. Um, I'll go on with the Q&A box then. So there's a question, or actually a couple of questions about um, uh, nanotechnology. And this is maybe a bit peripheral to what you were talking about, but um, we've got a question about whether um, these kind of nanostructures can be used to um, eat pollution or make um, uh, um, synthetic um, human AI or um, treat cancer, anything like that. Um, maybe you could just generally say something about the applications of these um, self-assembled structures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, currently we just show a very, um, uh, this is kind of a model system, right? We didn't uh, incorporate into the system any functionality. Uh, I think the only function of the system right now is to use it as a, a, a as a mask. But if we want to in incorporate any uh, functionality further, uh, first of all, uh, we want to make uh, the uh, we, we want to change the um, um, uh, the chemical the, the chemistry of the blocks we use. For example, if we want to make it to be a conductive material, then we want to mix into uh, the system some metal ions. Or if we want to uh, make some of the groups to be ionically conduct uh, conducting. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is the uh, domain size of the uh, uh, of the mesh morphology. So as one of the, uh, the audience uh, indicates, if we want to uh, eat up the pollution in water, then uh, typically we want to make the uh, the whole size to be smaller because that will create a larger selectivity for uh, molecules with different sizes. And that is, I think, uh, is an ongoing direction of this project that is to demonstrate whether this uh, assembly still works when we uh, change the degree of parameterization, if we whether we can achieve even smaller sizes of the uh, of the mesh structure, and for uh, the first application I just mentioned, if we want to make a conductive network, then the whole size might be of a smaller problem. Maybe we can make it larger to um, uh, get a, to make it more flexible. To uh, for example, yeah. So I think there are many. Uh, directions so that we can go after because this is a very first case of showing uh, uh, the bottom-up design of polymer materials to spontaneously form these kind of mass structures uh, and I think in the future we will uh, turn this model system into uh, real-world applications yeah great okay um one more question from the Q&A box um uh, says, thank you for the amazing talk. I'm wondering how side chains A and B are oriented into two separated regions, your top mm. and bottom regions in the scheme. So how yeah. do the um, those side chains A and B separate? Yeah, so I think uh, it's kind of hard to detect it experimentally, right? Because uh, we can only- uh, You lost your sound. That a collection of these side chains using- See how uh, we lost your sound. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Sharice, can you- Yes, we can hear the sound you. Working again? I can hear you. Caroline, can you hear me? I can hear you. See how do you want to try again? Yeah, I just mute and unmute myself. Okay, okay, good. Okay, All right, sorry. Um, Let's go back yeah. to that question then. So how the A and B side chains separate. Yeah. So I, I think it's kind of hard to uh, probe experimentally uh, for e electron uh, micro microscopy or uh, X-ray scattering. We can only see a collection of chains, right? So they, they form a block. We say uh, well, this is block A and block B, but we can see individual chains. Our best chance is to use simulation tools to understand how chains are uh, arranged in such uh, in, in such uh, morphologies. And uh, in this slide, we just uh, showed uh, how the side chains are packed. Actually, I think uh, from this picture, you can you can see that the side chains are quite coiled um, uh, when compared to the backbone. And I think. Uh, uh, because as, as I said, we uh, experimentally observe these uh, mesh-like morphologies, so I think the side chain will find a way to fit themselves in the uh, in the in the corresponding region. Yeah. 
Okay. And I think the best thing we can do is to statistically uh, count the uh, uh, find out the distribution of the side chain lens. But uh, an individual chain might be of less importance in our uh, system here. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And the, um, we've got time for one or two questions. Let me ask one um, then. Um, do you think that the M15 structures are um, going to occur for generically for um, uh, these tri-block Janus polymers? Or is there something special about the blocks that were used in this particular example that allowed that to happen? Yeah, that is a very good question. So I think um, our, first of all, our simulation, which is in good accordance with our experimental results, it uses a core, uh, a core screening uh, model. So that has no chemical information in it. And it still forms this, uh, uh, very beautifully aligned M15 structure. So that itself indicates that uh, it's irrelevant of uh, the specific compositions of our polymer. So that's one thing. And I think uh, we have a relatively weak uh, uh, experimental uh, evidence that is from a different paper uh, published on nature materials. So uh, yeah, I, I, I might too have to go to um, some slides before, yeah. So uh, I mentioned that um, we use this uh, uh, tri-block drainless bottle brush called polymer architecture uh, developed in this paper. And this paper, they use much shorter uh, side chains and they also use different chemical blocks like, like PEO instead of uh, PDMS. And by doing sex, they also observed that while the dye block forms dry roid, the tri-block uh, forms a relatively broad peaks. And I think that's indicative of forming this M15 structure because I think the characteristic uh, 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 peak uh, uh, shape is like this very broad peak. And uh, that's absolutely not dry right, but uh, at current stage, because we are we do not have uh, real uh, real space imaging evidence, so it's kind of too early to draw the conclusion. But I think uh, it may also be a new network morphology. It may be M fifteen, it may be something else, but it's not dry right. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. So this may be ubiquitous, but no one's found it before you. All right. Um. Are there any other last questions? If not, we will thank Zhihao again very much for a lovely talk with beautiful slides. And um, let me remind you of the next um, seminar in this series, which is on February the 14th, I believe, um, coming up next month. So thanks a lot, Zhihao, and we will um, close the session now. Thank you.